Hello, my friend. My name is Byron, and I'm from the BJJ Brick Podcast. I want to thank you for checking out the podcast on the YouTube channel here. It's a weekly show dedicated to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and having fun on the mats. Enjoy the show. Back to... Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back to the BJJ Brick Podcast. This is episode 227. This is Joe coming at you. I got uh, Gary and Byron on the line with me. Guys, how are you doing today? We are doing great, Joe. How about you? I'm doing really good. It's been... Uh, busy week i work uh, shift work i just got home friday so how many days do you get off after you come back uh come back on land 14 i do 14 days at work and 14 days at home okay that's right i i remember talking to you really early uh when we first met you when you uh, uh came on our show i remember you were saying that yep so i'm looking another uh two weeks off basically yep awesome time to train (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and more podcasts. We, I mean, this is a, a great episode. We have Dante Leon on the show. Uh, he just recently, about six months ago, got his black belt, and he had basically torn up all the color belts and did amazing coming up through the ranks. And now uh, it gets really interesting as he uh, is going after these black belts and having amazing matches and uh, really performing well. And, and he talks about that, making that transition, how it's, you know, you go from watching these people compete you know, when he started, some of these people had black belts around his, their waist, and now he's on the mat with them and competing with them, and that's a really cool experience. And this guy is just somebody that you're going to want to watch for years to come. Uh, it's great to introduce him uh, to the audience here. So really cool opportunity. Uh, I hope you enjoy learning from Dante Leon and learning a little bit about what he's going through to make himself the best grappler he possibly could be. Yeah, I'm looking at his uh, BJJ Heroes bio, and it looks like he's a pretty well-rounded guy. He's got five submissions recently, and only two of them are the same. He's got two knee bars, and then the other three are an arm bar and a couple of chokes, it looks like. So looks like a w- really well-rounded guy. Yep, you don't know where he's going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> he's an equal opportunity submitter. Hey, recently uh, we got contacted by a company, and we actually decided to pick them up as a sponsor. We've been, I think last year we probably got uh, contacted by maybe six or so companies. And, you know, we looked into a couple of them, or at least I did. And they just didn't really feel like something that I wanted. I think the most recent one uh, was like a big supplement company that you've probably heard on other podcasts. And I don't do supplements myself. And I don't know about Gary and Joe, but it's just like, it's hard to get behind that. If you don't do it, if you, I mean, it's something that I was, I was doing, I think I would, it would be more, uh, easy to talk about and and I'd feel like my heart was behind it but we actually got uh, something that you know not a gi company not a grip tape not a a soap company uh what do we have here gentlemen to talk about we have a company called Health IQ uh they are a life insurance company they are not a broker they are actually an insurer but the really neat thing about this company is they have special rates for people who are in shape like ourselves and like our listeners. Um, you know, they have special rates for cyclists, for vegans, for triathletes, for marathon runners. It's just a really cool concept where if you keep yourself in shape, you're not going to pay full premiums, uh, you know, with, you're not going to be in a pool with unhealthy people and, and pay more. So, um, you know, I think it would be a benefit uh, to save a little bit of money and, and check it out for, for our listeners. Yeah, it sounds like they basically do a risk assessment. And the lower your score, the lower your rate. So if you can earn a good score by keeping your weight in check, exercising three to five times a week, uh, eating the right foods, then you'll, then you'll pay what you deserve to pay. I think everybody can get behind that. Yeah. And that, that's the beauty of jiu-jitsu is really we found a enjoyable way to be in shape. We're not, we're not dragging ourselves to go exercise every day. You go to, to work out and with a smile on your face, and yes, you get sweaty, and you work hard, and you get your heart rate up, but it's a fun process. And that's one thing that we're able to maintain for many, many years and, and keep going and actually you know, bring in that lifestyle. 
And that's really what Health IQ is wanting to do is to reward you for that. You're not lumped in to the same category as people that come home from work and sit on the couch with a bag of potato chips and watch uh, you know, reruns of movies or whatever people do. They don't do jujitsu. I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, it's not fair to be to be lumped in with with those uh, people that that don't really take care of themselves because statistically that they leave this earth earlier than people who do take care of themselves in exercise, and that's really what it is about assessing that risk. That's what Health IQ does, and they reward you for that uh, with you know rates that are really uh meant to to save you money because it's uh that's what it is they they say how much do you work out what do you do and how could uh we adjust your health insurance based on that and yeah it's, that's really it's a cool concept it makes it makes sense if you think about it because if you look at the average person walking around or laying down on the couch um you don't need to be lumped in with them when you're buying life insurance because you're living a healthier lifestyle just by the fact that you're training jujitsu you're on the mats you're using those muscles and working out. So it's a cool concept. We'll put a link in the show notes uh, to go check them out, uh, get a free quote, and uh, and check them out. It's, it's a, I never heard anything quite like this, and it sounds really cool. Yeah, definitely check it out, Health IQ. All right, gentlemen, this time we have a off-the-mat lesson provided by yours truly. And uh, Gary and I were kind of confronted with an interesting situation that happened this week. Got an email from a... Uh, a friend of ours who is a detective on the police department here, and they're looking for somebody. Okay, that's not very common. I get that sort of an email. But really, it was a picture of a person with their face pretty much mostly covered, you know, sunglasses and kind of in a shady area anyway. But they had a jiu-jitsu shirt on. It's like, oh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a small community here, and Gary and I have been part of it for many, many years. And it just said, uh, do you guys know who this is? So I, you know, I sent it to a couple people. And, and, and tried to, get, you know, have a guess and, and look at it. And so did Gary. He had, had some theories or whatever. But really, <laughs> what I learned from this is it really upset the instructor whose name was on this shirt. It's like, dang, somebody is wearing my hoodie and going around and uh, burglarizing places. And, and it, 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 I could, it bothered him. It hurt him. It's like, you know, it's, it's almost like he's endorsed this behavior. And to kind of drag this lesson... Uh, back onto the mat, but really not even have to do that. Just if you have a shirt that says Jiu-Jitsu or has, you know, your school logo on there or whatever, and you're out making a kind of a fool of yourself, I mean, you might even just be, you know, at the club and, and acting like an idiot or, uh, you know, just if you have a bumper sticker on your vehicle and you drive like a maniac, that you know, it's like they're going to associate that behavior with your uh, school. And I think that's just a simple way to like kind of keep an idea like, I'm representing somebody when I wear this shirt. I need to represent that uh, school or organization in a positive light. And so when you have that stuff on, you should be a good person anyway, but when you're representing your team or your school, present that with the best face you can. Yeah, that's a really good point. Hopefully none of our listeners are out there burglarizing anything. But uh, (laughs) Yeah, whatever you do, keep in mind that you are representing your school. I suppose an incident like this might make uh, some instructors and school owners rethink their merchandising and branding because I I've visited a couple schools where they hand out t-shirts and uh, bumper stickers like crazy. So I guess you got to be careful this day. Yeah. I normally only commit crimes when I'm wearing my BJJ. <laughs> uh, you know, so I always make sure I dress properly when I do just to give Byron a bad name. No, well, you just want to make sure you just want to make sure everybody is uh, threatened and intimidated by us. So you want to <laughs> make sure they know who you are. Well, we are the most intimidating show on the, the podcast <laughs> interwebs there. Oh, yeah, Gary. That's uh, that's what we're known for. <laughs> that is definitely what we're known for. And we're also known for the quote of the week. Not very many shows have the quote of the week, but we do. Um, this one here this week is from Yuri Nate. And the quote is, the highest compliment that you can pay me is to say that I work hard every day, that I never dog it. And, you know, the first thing I thought of when I saw this quote is I was like, man, dog's got a bad name, you know, because <laughs> at first, you know, I'm reading it. I never dog it. And I started thinking about my husky who is now in doggy heaven right now. But I remember my husky would just run all day long. Uh, she'd be out in the backyard running, come out, jump on me, run, start wrestling and want to go for walks. And I was like, 
man, where do dogs get bad names? My husky was always working. But, you know, I now have another dog, and uh, Teddy does like to lay on the floor, <laughs> lay on the couch. I mean, that's probably more typical dog behavior. So, you know, Teddy doesn't work as hard as my last dog, Cuse, did. But, uh, you know, that is a great compliment, you know, to say that you work hard each and every day. You know, every, you know, seven days a week that you're working hard, that you don't dog it. And, you know, a, a good quality to have, and it's like a quality that, you know, I'm trying to have my kids portray. You know, I'm always telling them that, you know, you need to work hard. You always need to work hard. I tell my, my son at, uh, at basketball practice, you know, you need to work harder than everybody. You know, show the coach that, you know, you're trying. You're going to do everything. My daughter, too, at cheer practice, I tell her the same thing. You know, I'll work everybody. And, uh, you know, just a great work ethic. It doesn't just help you on the match. It helps you in life. It helps you in your marriage. It helps you in anything you do. Or you could be like my dog, Teddy, and sleep 20 hours a day. Yeah, that is a, a a high compliment to pay somebody is that they work hard uh, every day, and that's you know we're always looking for ways to to bring up our teammates and and to give them uh, you know a little positive feedback. If you see somebody working hard, call them out on it. Hey, I, I like the way you're working today. You know, maybe they got tapped out a few times. Maybe they didn't have their best role, but were they working hard? And just recognizing that is a could be a great compliment. Yeah, this is uh, especially important when you're dealing with kids and most jujitsu savvy kids club these days. When you pay kids compliments like you're really good at that, you're really flexible, you're really fast. Those are things that some people can be just naturally without trying. And kids kind of naturally interpret it that way. And when you when they do a move really well and you say, oh, you're really good at that, it's not nearly as impactful if you say, I've been watching you work really hard to get that move down over the last few weeks. So something to think about for instructors. Yeah, I remember uh, back in the day, my son was wrestling and, you know, my son was an average wrestler, you know, would win one, lose one, win one, lose two. And he did not make states. And after states, normally the only wrestlers who stayed were people going on to, or after regionals, the only wrestlers that kept going were wrestlers going on to states. And, and it was uh, about a three to four week time between that. And my son still kept showing up for practice. And I remember one of the coaches took him aside and said, and I don't even think he knew my son's name. There were so many people in the room and, you know, my son was nothing special. But he, he said, son, you know, I really appreciate you coming out here and working hard. You know, everybody else has went home. You know, you have my admiration. You're such a hard worker. And my son brings that up all the time. And uh, I'll never forget the look on his face when that coach said that to him. It, it meant the world to him. That's awesome. Who, who, what was the quote again? One more time, Gary. The quote, the highest compliment that you can pay me is to say that I work hard every day, that I never buy in it. <laughs> Who's that oh, by? I'm sorry. I never dog it. Dog it. Classic. By the poet. By the poet. Who's that poet? <laughs> you guys set me <laughs> up. Is he related to Ima? I'm a poopy. Yuri, Yuri Nate. Yuri Nate. I think oh, he's my God. To Ima. <laughs> you got me with it, too. <laughs> Yuri Nate. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was. How'd you guys not laugh? I don't know. <laughs> I just found out about the joke. I did. I just sent Joe a you text know, over Facebook and told him about it. Well, it's funny. Right after I read it, I was like, "They got to be messing with me." And I was like, "No, nah, sounds right. Nobody's laughing." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, I tried to. It's Man, hard I, to find those that aren't like super dirty, but uh, Man, Yuri Nate is a good one. Yeah. I am a sucker. <laughs> but uh, actually, Wayne Gretzky said that, so that takes it to another level. That's I fall quote. for this every week. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's like, yep, that, that, the uh, health IQ test is correct. You know, the guys <laughs> in Kansas aren't the brightest. <laughs> oh, man. But I'm actually from New York, though, so. There you go. That's oh. any better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's worse. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, good times ahead with our interview with Dante Leon. Here we go. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. He once drilled so long, BP endorsed him. When he signs up for a tournament, his opponents typically announce their retirement. His choking game is so strong, every party he attends becomes a slumber party. Some say keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I have choked all my friends 
and my enemies are nowhere to be found. Let the sweat times roll, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Dante Leon to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Dante, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, man. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Uh, you've definitely uh, have made a turned a lot of heads, I guess is the way to say that. But uh, uh, you've come up through the ranks and you've done very well. And and uh, really excited to to watch you grapple this year. And and you had an amazing year last year as well. But Dante, kind of introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, help us get to know you a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I'm a 22 year old black belt uh, training out of Toledo, Ohio, with GF Team. Um, I've been a black belt for about six months now. I received my black belt after I took second place at Brown Belt Worlds. So, uh, this year, uh, big goals are to, um, compete and get some big results at all the major tournaments, you know, PANS Worlds, Abu Dhabi World Pro and grow from there. Um, my career is jujitsu. My life is jujitsu, you know, between, uh, teaching seminars and, and training full-time as an athlete. So it's just kind of my goal is to uh, just be the best in the world. That's a, an awesome goal. How long have you been training? I've been training uh, for about a little over 10 years now. I started when I was 12. I'm actually from Canada. So started in a small gym near my hometown in Canada. And then the more I competed, uh, I moved on from there, ended up, since I was so close to the border of the USA, I ended up crossing the border up to six times a week, actually, to train. So um, now I live full-time in the United States, uh, training here with my team uh, in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, take me back a little bit more. Like You're 12 years old. W- when did, did you just start to click for you? When did it become something that you thought you could be uh, very good at? Um, like when I first started it, um, everybody would kind of tell me that I had potential, uh, things like that. And I guess it kind of came a little easier to me than most, but I never really took it very seriously. I was still playing other sports. I was still like full time in hockey. Um, I was a young kid too. So there's always other distractions and everything. But after my first tournament, I really fell in love with it. I had great results. I won both divisions I entered. And then after that, I kind of made my decision after I competed that like, hey, this is like, this is really cool. You know what I mean? This is what I want to do. So I'd say after my first two competitions is when it all took off for me. And then uh, I committed to it full force. And what belt were you back then when your first two competitions? My first competitions, I was actually a white belt. Because I would I would train like pretty consistent and then I take like, you know, a couple months off here and there when hockey was picking up or train like once a week for a few months, you know, something like that. So I was always kind of behind in the promotions, you know, I was I was just still a white belt with a couple stripes. Uh, I entered, I think, the intermediate divisions as a kid for my weight class and gi and no gi it was like a it was actually the arnold's my first tournament was the arnold's back when naga used to run it and uh the arnold classic in columbus ohio and that was my first one so um after after my first two tournaments i got my yellow belt and then progressed up the ranks from there until the, the uh adult ranks and you started competing with adults even uh when you could have still done uh tournaments with with the kids is that correct yeah, I think my first time I competed adult was on my 15th birthday. Like, <laughs> it was like a, wow. day, a day or two after my 15th birthday, I like, decided uh, my instructor at the time was like, hey, man, you should, just, you should just go and fight adult. It's not a very big tournament. You know, just see how you do. So I fought in the, teen, uh, the teens division, and then I said, yeah, sure, I'll try it. I'll do it. And uh, I won. Actually, I won both divisions there, too. I won uh, – the blue belt, my weight class, and then I also won the uh, intermediate adult nogi too. What was that that like? I mean, like maybe think of yourself as talking to uh, younger athletes that are you know fifteen, sixteen years old, and and maybe you know really wanting to take this seriously and considering taking that step to compete with the adults or to continue to do really well in in their age division. Uh, what was that like? Kind of describe that or maybe give those kids advice. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I always tell uh, the younger guys, you know, teens and the young kids, uh, 
when they ask me about that or, or that ever comes up. It was a lot different for me back in the day because jujitsu wasn't as popular and I didn't come from an area such as like California, New York, Florida, where BJJ is really vast. You know what I mean? And there weren't a lot of practitioners uh, really where I was and, and where I am. So me being a kid, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, I was pretty much like the only kid who trained consistently and trained really hard. So once I hit a certain age, I just trained in the adult class. And I think the next youngest kid was probably, you know, 17 or 18 and I'm 13, 14, 15 years old. So it was a lot different for me to compete against adult was kind of normal because I just trained with adults. Nowadays, you see a lot of these teams, example, like Atos, the Mendez brothers, and, and a bunch of others, they have these huge kids teams, these huge uh, teenage classes, juvenile classes. So I never really had that as a kid. I never really had other kids to train with. I only really had adults. So um, it was really, really different for me. I guess you could say the transition might have been a little bit easier for me, a little bit more natural. But uh, jiu-jitsu is definitely at a, at a different point now. It, it sounds like because of your training partners, uh, the transition to competing with adults uh, made that pretty uh, – your training partners helped make that smooth. Yeah, yeah, because there was no option for me to really stay in the kids' classes. Once I was um, outside of that 8 to 12-year-old range, there was no real class for you. So you could either like stay back in the kids' class, but you know when you're 13 and 14 and even 12 when you start to – I'll really find your edge in jiu-jitsu. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't really do you any good to stay and train with, you know, eight-year-olds and, and kids who, you know, are half your size. So you move up to the adults and you got to face your fears pretty quick. You know what I mean? <laughs> As a kid, um, in that kind of that transitional age where you're starting to compete with adults, do you remember what your game was like or what type of techniques you would do? I I'm, I'm still uh, have a lot of focus on my guard to this day. Um, but I'm more balanced, I'd say, today. But back then, I had almost all the focus on my guard because it was impossible for me to take anybody down. Um, I didn't have a great wrestling background. I didn't come from a wrestling background. So being 110 or 120 pounds back then uh, wasn't really possible for me to shoot in and take down grown adults. So all my roles would start by either me getting taken down or me pulling guard. So um after being in the guard so long, I just put a lot of focus on my guard and, and developed that the most. So I'd say back then I was more of a guard player. Now I'm kind of more balanced both uh, on top and the guard as well. Now I know you're a full-time jiu-jitsu uh, person. Are you teaching jiu-jitsu or mostly just focused on competing for yourself? Uh, I teach seminars. I teach privates, uh, things like that, the occasional uh, kids' class and everything. But I um, – I'm pretty much just just an athlete, you know what I mean? I have okay. a great group of guys here in Toledo, other world champions uh, training here, other guys close by from GF team. So we have a great, great group of guys here, and, and we're pretty much all athletes and all focused on the same goals, all living together and training together. Sounds like a great environment to, to produce high-level uh, competitors. Yeah, it's old school. You know, it's like an old school, old school fight camp year round. We all live together and train together. We're all the best of friends. So it's it's really, really good. Do you prefer gi, no gi, uh, or doing both? Honestly, it all depends on the time of year that you ask me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Once I get done with the, once I get done with the no gi season, I don't want to put the gi back on, you know, or I, I want to, I just can't wait to get the gi back on. After I get done, you know, after no gi worlds and stuff, and then after gi worlds, I'm almost looking forward to jumping into some no gi tournaments, you know. So it kind of depends on what time of year that you catch me. Uh, I love to compete in both, even if I'm focusing on tournaments in the gi, I'll still jump into no gi tournaments and and vice versa. So um, I really like both. It just depends on what time of year you catch me. I guess uh, what my answer will be right now. Obviously, really focused on the gi with uh, Pan Am's Worlds, uh, World Pro, all all those big tournaments coming up. So, with all that around the corner, 
are you doing any nogi training now, or does that totally off until uh, nogi season kicks back up? Um, it depends. You know, I always I always throw a little bit of nogi in there, but um, the the main focus right now is definitely in the gi, especially. We're getting close to the Pan Am. Pan Am is beginning of March this year. We're already in February. So these these uh, four to five weeks leading up to Pans is, is definitely going to be just strictly training camp in the gi, competition-based, drills, position training, everything like that uh, geared towards gi competition. Dante, what part of uh, training or like the actual – uh, jiu-jitsu training, uh, do you feel that you grow the most? Just real, real, real hard training, you know? Um, <clears throat> just locking the doors of your gym or locking the doors of the place you're at, getting a good group of guys together, and then just beating the snot out of each other, you know? That's the uh, that's the way that your jiu-jitsu is going to grow the most, and you're going to grow the most as a competitor, you know? Um as a, that's coming from a competitor side. Now, if you if you want to come from a little different side, if you want to talk about your, the technical aspect, I think position training and specific training is also really important for not only competitors but also somebody who's just looking to improve. You know, you always need to put yourself in bad spots and uh, try and work out of it, try and improve on the gray areas. You know, that's why I think that real hard training with with the right training partners the guys who can push you is good because you're always going to get into some place uncomfortable you're never going to be able to keep the whole training session in your comfort zone you know um every day i like to basically you know training six times a week um off on sundays five to six times a week actually i like to train like that every day that's part of our regimen we like to just have a one session Usually up to two hours where we just train really, really hard with each other, depending on how we, we vary the length of the matches. But we go, you know, eight to ten rolls each. And um, it's just a tournament. It's almost like a tournament every day, you know. So that's how – that's the best way for us to get ready for a tournament. That's the best way for us to grow our jiu-jitsu. And then we also implement other uh, training methods as well. I think with that – uh, method of training you get you push yourself and you know that you're pushing yourself and you know when you're in these tournaments and you're in you know it, after the first few rounds go by you get a little uh more tired or, or you get to that range where you're pushing yourself a little bit and you've been there so many times before i think that that could be a, a big uh mental advantage to just know yeah i did this like four times last week i was this tired and i can yeah. still grapple just fine yeah for sure for sure and then you know every single day uh, it just gets worse and worse as the week goes on. You know, Monday's all good. Everybody's gung ho. Everybody's ready to go, and um, you know, balls to the walls a little bit. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you start to see it, you know, trickle down a little bit. And then you know, we train uh, this week. We train Monday through till today. Uh, just got done actually about an hour ago <clears throat> with our competition training, and. Uh, dead just absolutely dead everybody in the room the everybody was dead there was just nothing left you know what i mean and that that's kind of what you want at the end of the week you just want to be you don't want to have anything left to give you want to leave every single day you you leave the gym if if you're training for these big tournaments you want to give every single thing you have in your body you know so when it comes to that tournament you're used to giving everything you have nothing left in the tank you know you empty the bucket uh, every time you step on the mat. Uh, Dante, training like that, do you find yourself having uh, certain techniques that you prefer to do uh, if you're tired, like a certain kind of a recovery thing that you could do, or do you play the same game as the training session goes on from start to finish? Uh, yeah, you know, there's always there's always times where, you know, you're training for competition, obviously, so you're going to do the moves uh, that you're going to do in competition. That's kind of going to be what you focus on when you do this this type of training and, and when you do get tired your body does revert back to what's natural and what's habit you know so uh what you feel the most comfortable in when you're completely exhausted and, and every everything's just zapped out of your body you're going to revert back to you know what your body's used to what your body has trained for so many years so uh, there definitely are some techniques that uh, everybody else else and myself do go towards but 
you know, with uh, the guys here, you know, with the whole GF team motto, never stopping. Uh, you don't have much time to stall or do anything. There's always going to be somebody yelling at you to go. There's always going to be somebody trying to, you know, tear your head off. So every once in a while when you're dead tired and you're trying to put the brakes on the match, um, you're just forced to keep going and keep moving and keep pushing and, and stay uncomfortable. Tell me a little bit about your off the mat training. Lift weights four times a week. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the conjugate method or anybody out there. Um, West Side Barbell, Louis Simmons. Um, that that's kind of the method we follow. We throw in some other things there, but we're big believers on the conjugate method. Um, all of us and my trainer as well. So it's basically you work out your lower body and your upper body twice a week each. One time is lifting heavy. The other time is lifting lighter weights really fast. So you work your diesel strength and you work your speed too, which is great for jujitsu. So it improves the, 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 your strength, but it's also improving your speed and uh, explosiveness at the same kind of at the same in the same program there. Yep. Yep. It, it, it improves everything. Yeah. Cardio too. We always throw in some cardio um, while we're doing weights and then we do it right in the morning too. Um, you know, one to get it out of the way when your body's just waking up fresh, we get a good breakfast in and then we go hit the weights really hard. But, um, right after, after this, we get our food in, we take our supplements and everything. And then we step on the mat. We either have a drilling session or we have our competition training or position training. You know, we, we change it from day to day now in the camp, but, um, it zaps you, man. You know, <laughs> your muscles are tired. Your body's tired. Yeah. Uh, you're forced to push in the weight room because, you know, you're with those same guys that you're there training with on the mat. Those same guys that are pushing you on the mat training jujitsu, they're also pushing you and pushing each other um, in the weight room, you know. And there's uh, your coach is there in the weight room and he's pushing you too. And, and, and we're just together all the time. So we're always pushing each other. Everything we do when we drill, we do specific training, competition training, lifting weights, um, everything. We're always pushing each other. We're always uh, basically trying to make each other quit. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that's great. That's, that's an interesting dynamic. So you guys uh, lift weights and work out together and then also go train on the mats together. It's the same group of people. Together, we eat together. Everybody sleeps in the same house. We're all we're together almost 24-7, man. How many people are in that group? Uh, there's seven people in the group right now, um, but there's always going to be others coming in. You know, GF team, we got a big team. Uh, just new thing, Flow Grappling put it out, so everybody might be a little bit familiar with it now, but GF team is making this huge switch over. Everybody's moving down to California now, so <clears throat> it's easy for them to come down to Ohio now. We have a big team here, also a big team in California. So our doors are always open to, like we said, for the training camp, you know, obviously to GF team members, but to almost anybody out there who's willing to, from any team, who's willing to train hard and uh, bust their tail here, you know. So we, we could have, we got, you know, seven or eight guys now. We could have 20 guys. We could have 10 guys. You know, you never know. There's always room for more. Yeah, you've been a guy who has basically been competing uh, since you started jiu-jitsu. Um, yep. What's the transition like going from uh, the colored belt to black belt uh, with the competition? Oh, it's completely different, you know. Um, <clears throat> every single division's hard. Every single tournament's hard. No such thing as easy tournaments. No such thing as an easy fight anymore. It's it's black belt. You get to compete against people who've had their black belts longer than you've really trained. That's almost hard to imagine, you know. So... Um, it's just completely different. There's these guys that you watched when you were a kid and these guys that you watched when you were a blue belt or a purple belt, even a brown belt. <clears throat> you admired their game. You tried to drill some of their techniques. You tried to, like, emulate their game, and now they're in your division. you got to compete against them. You know, it's it's a wild thought. It's definitely crazy, but I, I really, really do. I really do enjoy it. I do enjoy being at the black belt level. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's giving me so much – motivation to better myself and better my jiu-jitsu because i know i'm sharing the mat with uh some of the best athletes in the world you know so 
Um, it's definitely given me a new level of motivation and um, definitely motivated me. So I really enjoy it. I really like it. And I just need to trust in the process and, and stick with it. Is there anything you have to do uh, that's different as a black belt when you're across the mat in the purple belt and you look at somebody and you really don't know uh, much about them or maybe you've rolled them once or twice before, but as a black belt, you're standing across the mat and you've watched this person uh, compete at this black belt level for quite a while. Did you need to like do anything mentally before the match to kind of prepare yourself or have you found anything that helps with that? Or do you just go out there and, and just take it to them? Um, I think everything, I think, you know, the mental game, obviously, in, in sports, in competitive sports, in combat sports, is a huge, huge thing. You know, there's always that argument that it's more important than the physical side, and, and I agree with that. But um, I think that the mental aspect and, and the, the mental game needs to be within oneself. You know, you need to better your mind, and, and you need to do that as an individual. If you start to worry about, you know, this guy and that guy and, and you start to worry about every single guy and worry about your bracket, worry about who's in front of you, um, you're going to find yourself overwhelmed, you know. Purple belt is definitely a, a tough belt. That's when, you know, a lot of guys are professionals at purple belt. A lot of guys just train at purple belt. Um, at brown belt too, you're, you're not running into – it's basically like a D1 college purple belt and brown belt, right? It's these guys. That's all they do. They just train, uh, eat, and sleep. That's it. So black belt's just the same, except they just have more experience, and they've just been doing it longer. That's it. You know, the purple belts and brown belts that are world class are eventually the ones who are going to turn into the black belts that are world class for the most part. So uh, the mental game needs to be worked from the beginning. You know, from your beginning of your competitive career until the black belt, it needs to continue bettering through your black belt career. And uh, it's very uh, individualized. You know, you need to work on yourself, improving yourself, improving your confidence and everything to prepare for just about anybody. Because we see these black belt classes, you know, middleweight black belt, lightweight black belt, middle heavy black belt are ones that come to mind where uh, there is – six to 10 guys in that division who could be world champion on any given day. So um, if you start to worry about every single one of them, or if you're going to fight every single guy or have a different game plan for every single one, I think I, in my opinion, you're going to find yourself just a little bit overwhelmed and uh, it's almost too much to handle. Uh, like you mentioned earlier, um, uh, the mental side can be become more important than the actual physical side. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yep. Yep. Uh, I believe that, to be true in any sport. People hear that and they, they see a guy like you who trains so much and, and you're training off the mat and you're uh, super athletic. And then they hear that it's like, yeah, right. But, but in reality, if you're not in the game mentally, you're not in the game at all. And so yeah, like, even if, like if you wake up and roll out of bed, you're going to, you're going to just choke me unconscious within 30 seconds. Like <laughs> it doesn't take that much, but if 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 you are distracted or you've got some like major problems at home with uh, you know some fiance is breaking up with you whatever like that's a huge uh, that's going to affect everything on your game so not, people think about trying to get from ninety percent to one hundred percent mentally affected but if you're down low uh, and having a hard time getting your head in the game uh, it's going to affect everything you do on the mat. Yeah, for sure. For and I sure. don't know if you're engaged or anything like that, but that's just throw an example. You're a young man, so <laughs> I, a thousand percent. Because you know, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of guys out there who a lot of people complain and they say, you know, oh that guy doesn't train very hard or he doesn't train a lot. But when they go to the tournament, they win. And to me, what that shows is that doesn't just show that this guy is so gifted. I mean, yeah, he is gifted in everything if he can get away with not training as hard. But his mind is there. He's got a great mind for competition. You know, he knows when to, to flip that switch. He knows when to turn it on and turn it off. So that's something um, that a lot of people don't have. A lot of people struggle with in, like I said, all sports, you know. So um, all this training and everything that we all do is not just to prepare our body. We obviously want to be in great physical condition, uh, competing for six, eight, ten minutes at a time for each, each fight, but um, we want to have our mental game up high, and, and that's what you do when you do this competition-style training, when you're having these 
you know, these basically these marathon training days, you know, you're in the gym in the morning for an hour to an hour and a half. You're training on the mats for an hour and a half, two hours, right into drilling, right into, um, right into, uh, drilling or specific training. So, you know, you're training for sometimes five hours, six hours a day even. So, um, that's a mental test right there. And that's a mental test that's going to translate to the competition. Uh, Dante, let's just give you like a kind of a scenario. You're in the house training with all these guys. There's somebody who is like doing amazing. Uh, when you're on the mat with them, it's like this person is, is, is they're there. They've got it. They go out and they compete and they kind of come up short and it's pretty consistent. What do you tell that person to kind of help them uh, take their, their in the gym game and bring that onto the mat with them when they go to compete? What, what are they lacking? Uh, you're saying somebody who's great in the gym but not great in the tournament? Yeah, what, if that's one of your teammates there, uh, what kind of a conversation do you have or, or how do you help that person get out of that rut? Well, first we, we uh, first you got to kind of um, introduce it to them, you know what I mean? you got to kind of tell them, hey, man, you know, in the gym, you're a killer, blah, 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 you know. We got to translate this to the tournament. You know, you got to you got to help them see it, kind of. You know, help them see what the issue is, and then you have to emulate what is going wrong in the tournament in the gym. You know, you have to make the training like a tournament. You're preparing for a tournament with this type of training. You know, this type of training here is not for the guy with the nine to five. You know, that's that's the classes. That's the the technique drilling in the class and then the training after and the privates on the side and all that you know that's great that's awesome but if you want to be a competitor you have to emulate what's going to happen every single thing that's going to happen in a competition in the gym you know you have to emulate um being in you know basically you're gonna have to train with injury you're gonna have to train with fatigue you're gonna have to train being down on points up on points Every single thing you can imagine, you know. So the more you train like it's a tournament, the more you emulate a tournament in the gym, the more natural it becomes, the easier it becomes um, once you step on the mat for the tournament, you know. And then bringing it back to the last thing is that mental game. You know, the mental game is the biggest thing. You can have the the best, uh, the most high-level uh, physical preparedness out there, but if your mind is somewhere else, I mean – Put a fork in it, you're pretty well done, you know. So, um, you know, got to work on your mind, definitely. When you get free time, there's a lot of different things you can do to work on your mind. Meditation, um, you know, reflect on your days of training, different things like that. Reading, yoga, all types of things you can do to better your mind, clear your mind, have an open mind uh, for the competition side of training and, and competition itself. You listed a lot of different things you could do to help yourself uh, clear your mind and, and get your mind ready. Do you have one of those that you actually prefer to do? Just kind of be on my own and kind of look inside, you know what I mean? See what's going on, see what I have to work with. I think the hardest thing for a lot of athletes is to really be honest with themselves. Be honest with themselves as a, like if they need help, if they need some certain thing. I think a lot of people have a lot of ego involved. They have a lot of uh, – how would I say, um, you know, they're not really comfortable uh, with looking at their weakness, you know, so uh, their ego might not allow them to do that. So sometimes they just kind of deny it or they just push it to the side. As a, as a world-class athlete, you got to be able to look in the mirror at yourself honestly and say that you're doing this good or that good or, hey, I need, I need help here. I'm not doing very well, you know. There's always something you can work on. There's always something you can work on in your mind and with your body and with your jiu-jitsu. So um, it all stems from your mind. It all stems from you um, making that decision to change in your mind. So I like to, you know, definitely on a Sunday, Saturday or Sunday when it's a rest day, it's quiet. You get to sleep in. You get a lot of rest. Get some good food in you. You know, maybe have a cheat meal. You know, drink a Coke or something like that if you're not too close to the tournament. And uh, just relax. Just let your mind be free. Have some time by yourself. Have, you know, some meditation and uh, kind of look inside and, and see what you can work on and see what you can do better. Yeah, that's that's all great advice. Um, you've been a black belt for about six months. 
competed quite a bit. Um, can you look back and maybe pick out uh, one of your favorite uh, black belt matches and and why uh, why you like that so much? I haven't had a whole lot of them yet, but uh, I had a couple that stick out. I uh, had a couple black belt matches in Russia that really stuck out to me. Um, had a match with Lucas Hosha at the American Nationals that stuck out to me. That's kind of was one of the turning points in my competitive career. Uh, this last Worlds, I had a really, really tough fight in the semifinals in my weight class against Josh Hinger. Um, went down to a ref's decision, and I ended up losing ref's decision. But um, it was a great fight, you know. It was a tough fight. We both pushed for it. We both um, tried to get the win. So it was a really good fight. Fights like that make you better as a person, make you better as a competitor. And, uh, you know, obviously you want the result to go your way. But, you know, even though the result didn't go my way, I'm I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, have such a tough fight and grow as an athlete. Yeah, and when you think about those matches with Josh or Lucas, like, uh, those are, I think that, you know, even with a person like Josh, uh, a tough match that comes down to a referee's decision, that's still, that's very impressive. Like, uh, you look at Josh and, like, you're at, you're there. You know, mm-hmm. you could have won the match, he could have won the match. Like, like, what he's doing, you could do. And I think that that could be a big um, you know, we talk about the mental game. If you're feeling like, oh man, this is gonna be this is gonna be tough, you just kind of remind yourself, hey, I can hang with this guy. I can hang with the with the rest of them. Yeah, um, that, yeah, that, that's 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 uh, that's that's cool that you've you've had those experiences and you you were able to look at them and 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 even take um, a loss of a of a referee's decision and and take that and learn from it. Yeah, of course. You, you always learn. You always learn something from your losses. You know what I mean. You always learn something. And even from your wins, you can always learn something depending on uh, how you want to look at it. Dante, you can't uh, do this sort of a lifestyle alone, and I know you've got a couple of sponsors. I'd like to hear uh, who they are and, and, and why you like them. A lot of support from uh, my good friend here and uh, one of my mentors here in Toledo, Ohio, Kelly Highmore. He helps me out so much. Um, he's given us you know, a place to train, a place to live. Um, supports me through my whole career, supported me since I was a purple belt, you know. Uh, so he is definitely a guy I have to thank. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, GF Team Toledo, you know, the gym that he owns, the gym where we train, you know, big, the most help to me, you know. Um, also like to thank my sponsors, Monkey Tape, um, the Jungle Gym, my good friend from Canada, who's helped me, you know, through, um, he's helped me with my, conditioning and my nutrition i'd also like to thank analyze my bjj and um soap 50 50 defense on bar soap um they've helped me a lot you know yeah that that's great and uh i'll put links to those in the show notes uh you mentioned that you sometimes will teach a seminar or, or that sort of thing are you um i know you're busy training all the time if somebody wanted to have you come in and, and, and teach a seminar, would that be something they could do, or are you you pretty focused on what you're doing now? No, I'm always always open to teach seminars. You know, there's always going to be times where I'm a little bit busier. Yeah. Um, you know, closer to tournaments and things like that. But there's a lot of there's a lot of days in the year, a lot of weekends in the year. So I'm always I'm always uh, looking for seminars. I really enjoy teaching seminars, especially to, you know, just to go different places and see different jujitsu. I love to train with different guys from a lot of different gyms and, and share my jiu-jitsu with uh, different people all over, no matter where it may be. So, yeah, I'm always open for seminars. I'm always interested. Do you have, like, a favorite social media somebody could follow you on or even get a hold of you if they want you to come over and teach? Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Those are my two social medias. Uh, I don't fool around with Twitter too much. Um, so can follow me. Dante Leon on Facebook, just my personal account, and then Dante Leon BJJ on Instagram. Um, I'm on there. I'm, I'm active on both. So uh, if you want to get a hold of me, shoot me a message on there. Are you ready to play the uh, fast money around like a family feud style? Yeah, let's okay. go. <laughs> Name something that many people only do two or three times in a lifetime. Fly on an airplane. Name something that many people put off doing because it's too expensive getting a new car 
Name something that might be canceled because of cold weather. School. Name something that might be dangerous to cross. Highway. Name something that might motivate a man to lose weight. Girlfriend. There you go. Or, that was a good answer, girlfriend. Um, <laughs> let's see. Name something that uh, people do just two or three times. There's not really... Flying isn't really on there. Um, something that's too expensive, buying a car. Um, people put off doing that because it's too expensive. 15 points. Uh, something that cancels because of the cold weather. You nailed that one. Uh, school was the number one answer. 42 nice. points. Name something that, you, that people are afraid to cross. Highway, 14 points. That was a good answer. Uh, rail, railroad track uh, was the number one answer on that one. And then... Uh, uh, name nice. something that motivated a man to lose weight. Number one answer, 54 points, was dating. So you got that one. Uh, <laughs> very good job. Not bad. Yeah. You got 125 points. Nice. That's really good. You uh, did this uh, one with uh, Tim Sled. He got 126. You're one right behind the leader. So, nice. Uh, <laughs> very impressive performance. <laughs> awesome that's man. fun I appreciate you doing that I appreciate you hopping on here and being uh, doing an interview with me hey thanks for having me man I really appreciate it and good luck and I'll, we'll be watching you as you compete uh, throughout the year and into the future and, and uh, it's been interesting learning how much work goes into uh, what we see uh, when we see on the mats yeah thanks so much man I, I really had fun and uh I hope all the viewers, listeners out there uh, enjoy what we had to say today. Man, thank you so much to Dante Leon uh, for stopping by and really getting him introduced to the audience. Uh, If you've had the privilege of watching him come up through the ranks, it's been fun. And if you just got introduced to him, go and find him on social media. We'll put some links uh, in the notes there and kind of keep up with his competition career as it uh, continues to develop. And he is, he's there. It's awesome. He's up there competing with the best in the world. And, uh, and he's he's doing great so it's just going to be really cool to watch him uh continue to grow and get even better as he as he goes made a little bit of a mistake i you know uh this whole thing about the family feud thing is fun and people are liking uh, to do it tim slid had a good time doing it and so did uh dante but uh i read the scores wrong i looked at the paper and i thought tim had a higher score actually tim sled scored 120 and dante scored uh 125 so we have a high score uh, by uh, congrats to Dante Leon for the, getting the high score so far out of two and not counting the, the gentleman here who have a couple of tries at it. But uh, yeah, cool. Good job there, my friend. Yeah, I'm like Joe. When Joe was talking about his BJJ Heroes uh, record there, I, I just went in and uh, checked him out. And uh, man, it's a who's who. Uh, this guy is incredible. Uh, Byron told me uh, before the interview, he's like, hey, you know, don't forget this name. Uh, keep an eye out for this guy. He's going to be uh, uh, all over. He's going to be one of the most recognizable names here in the future. So uh, definitely uh, check him out. He's uh, he's incredible. And uh, check out his uh, his BJJ Heroes page and uh, see all the uh, studs he's went against and all the studs that you know that uh, you know he's beaten. So just an incredible competitor. Yep, definitely plan on keeping an eye on this guy. Look forward to seeing what he does in the next year or so. Yep. Another thing you can keep an eye on is the uh, is our sponsor, uh, Health IQ. Uh, they're keeping an eye on uh, kind of the trend. They look at uh, runners, cyclists, weightlifters, uh, vegetarians, people that deserve lower rates on their life insurance. Added to the list is grapplers. <laughs> That's a really cool concept is that we're now recognized as people who are living these super healthy lifestyles and deserve to be uh, you know, kind of rewarded for it with paying uh, lower rates in in uh in life insurance if you grapple if you adopt this lifestyle you'll probably live longer than the average person who doesn't and uh health iq is the place to go to get uh the rate that you actually deserve there'll be a link on the show notes healthiq.com slash bjj brick is the link and you can check it out get a get a quote there uh, they have a little quiz that you could take and kind of see where you're at as far as your knowledge of of things that are healthy and, you know, one thing that's really cool about this company is they practice what they preach. They actually have a gym right in the middle of their headquarters, as I was looking through their webpage. And on top of that, they want you to go home early so you can don't miss time to work out. If you bring a, a candy bar or a, a soda into work, 
basically it gets taken away from you. You know, they practice what they preach. They are healthy and uh, they want to give us healthy people better rates on life insurance. So definitely uh, check it out. They're going to end up being flooded with job applications and resumes. <laughs> after Joe, you want to know the funny thing is I actually you already did. said years in. No, I looked at all the jobs they had available. <laughs> I was like, is there any for bankers? <laughs> 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 I was thinking, you know, man, all three of us could go get a job there and uh, we could work out. Uh, we could uh, we could put some wrestling mats in their room and uh, get get some work done. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> we'll keep on working on the podcast for the time being. Uh, the sponsor, we're really uh, enjoying the, the relationship we, we're building with them and, and just hoping that this additional income will help us produce an even better show and, you know, the highest quality show we could do at, uh, at a rate that's even, you know, more impressive. We've already added, uh, one show per month to the schedule, uh, you know, with, with Joe doing. So uh, thanks. Uh, to, <laughs> go ahead. Thank, thanks to Joe. Yep. That's, and that's re- really a large part by our Patreon supporters, uh, which we're still uh, relying on is, you know, they are our, you know, founding supporters and, uh, we thank them so much. And if you want to be, uh, supporter, you could go to the link with Patreon. We'll send you out a free gee patch and a BJJ Brick sticker as well. Invite you to the fa- the private Facebook group, and uh, you can support the show through that. And you know, that being said, we're trying the sponsorship thing out here. We really like the company Health IQ, but uh, you know, if I get a couple of Patreon supporters saying, "Hey, you know, we'd rather just be commercial free," um, we'll also listen to that. And and you know, any audience member, we we want to we want you guys to be happy with us. We're not going to add on them in any commercials, but um, the Patreon supporters they do have a little more say with with how things are because they are actually uh, backing us up and supporting us. So get a couple of emails from the Patreon supporters. Um, it'd be interesting to see how they think uh, this is going. Really, we're just going to be looking at, you know, reinvesting the money back into the show, into the podcast, to the website, whatever we need to make uh, this as strong as we can get it. So that's, that's our, that's really our plan. And yeah. <laughs> we, we have, I don't think we've talked about, it, but ultimately, you know, Joe lives in, in Texas and we live in Kansas uh, ultimately, you know, sometime in the next several months here, we hope to bring Joe up and train with him. And, and that would be, uh, you know, provided with <laughs> the transportation for that would be, you know, something with a sponsor that we, that we would be able to do. And it makes it much easier for us to, to do that. And somehow we'll make it worth everybody's time. I don't know, put some, uh, crazy videos on YouTube or something. <laughs> <laughs> Gary needs to get some crazy videos. I have a few already. Uh, my videos aren't legal for viewing, Byron. Oh. <laughs> we'll figure out something to do to kind of bridge that gap. Yeah, we can just, uh, you know, muddy the screen up, and uh, you won't be able to tell if that's me or a kangaroo. <laughs> I don't. Your boxing hey kids, videos are pretty web- bad. <laughs> hey, kids, if the website asks for your age before they let you on the site, <laughs> just don't go there. Don't go there. Even adults, okay. don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> But we do have a cool website for our article of the week, jujitsufamily.com. And this is by Jennifer Stewart. Um, the article is titled, Finding My Groove Again. And, and this is an interesting concept. And I think it speaks to a lot of people because if this is a, a lifestyle, a journey. You know, I, I urge you to think about it like that instead of just a, a point that has an end. You know, we say it's a uh, marathon, not a sprint. Even a marathon has an end. You get done with it. And you could stop running. You know, adopt this as a lifestyle. But sometimes you have like a bit of a, a bit of a downer, and you know, in that lifestyle, like man, I don't know if this is for me. And, and just kind of getting out of that groove. And that's really what this article is about: kind of evaluating uh, what to do, thinking of just doing a couple different uh, ways, and thinking of some positive things to bring it to you. I think it's a great article this week, gentlemen. Okay, I was going to say I tried something different this week. I read the article before we got on the air. Oh, good and, job, uh, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, what I like most about it is that uh, she's sort of giving herself permission to sort of accepting the fact that you're not going to eat, drink, and breathe jujitsu every day of your life for the rest of your life. And I would say, actually, for most adults, that's a healthy thing. If I put jujitsu as my very first priority, uh, I would be single right now. So, <laughs> you know, most people have a wife or a spouse and kids and a house and a job. And uh, you need to make sure that it occupies the right space in your life. And I like that uh, the author of this has kind of given themselves permission to not always be the most enthusiastic person about jujitsu. Yeah, that was awesome. And what I really liked is 
the name of the website is jujitsufamily.com. And then as she gives little uh, scenarios, you know, about jujitsu, um, she just talks about family in there, knowing your professor believes in you, the fun roles with your favorite training partner, um, you know, pride in watching teammates succeed. And man, that's what jujitsu is all about. It's, it's a big family. Uh, you get on the mat, you're going to have struggling days. You're going to have days that are going to be rough. But those people, they're all there for you. People that you probably wouldn't meet outside of jiu-jitsu. You know, a big, diverse group of people are in your jiu-jitsu gym. Uh, you know, everything from uh, doctors to uh, bankers to firefighters um, to uh, uh, sea captains. You know, everybody's there. It's a, it's a very diverse group. But you may be different, you know, in your upbringing, but it, it becomes one big family. It's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, and I definitely appreciate that because there's really a few places you could find such a diverse group of people and on the mat and have such a, a good relationship with those people. You know, everybody, you go to work, everybody kind of is similar at work. You know, you work in the same area as everybody. You, you know, if you go to school, every all those people are students. You know? uh, same stage in their life a lot of times. You go to Jitsu, you get a, a good mix of everybody. And it's just great to, to kind of meet those people you know, become friends with them and, and to, to bring them in. And, and so, you know, I think we probably have a few listeners who are uh, in a bit of a slump and maybe it's just fun to listen to the podcast, but not so fun to go train. And so go on the website and read some of her list about like some of the things that she really appreciates about you just so that you maybe not think about like being fully present during the role. You're not distracted. There, there's no cell phone. There's no Facebook. There's, there's nothing there to distract you. Somebody asking you questions, you're just rolling. You're out there uh, doing your thing. Uh, she also mentions being um, humble enough to learn from everyone, regardless of the butt color. And I think this is a great one. You know, I was grappling with a, a young guy uh, this morning, great wrestler, but, you know, his experience with, you know, actual jujitsu, you know, he, I guess he probably has a year or so, but, uh, you know, he, he definitely showed me a couple things wrestling side that I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And, and just be able to, to learn that from somebody. And, you know, not, not saying, oh, I could beat that with this. No, maybe I could learn from it. And I think that, you know, those are a couple of things. She's got a big list of a lot of different cool things here. Yep. A very good article, guys. Go check it out. Uh, check out the uh, webpage for other interesting content as well while you're there. Mentioned that, uh, you know, Joe's down there in Texas and we're up here in Kansas. Uh, if you're anywhere near us, Joe's kind of near Houston area, south of Houston, you said? That's correct. I'm about 50 minutes south of Houston. So if you're in the area, you can contact me through the uh, Facebook page um, and let me know. And I'd love to get together and train with you. Yep. And G Gary and I, I almost said Jerry, and Gary and I are in the Wichita, Kansas area. If you're coming through for any reason, give us a holler. And same thing. We'll like to train with you, get to know you. And, uh, and it's always great to meet another listener or to re-meet. If you've came by before, we're happy to have you back. It's always good times. And if you're some super freak athlete, Gary will be happy to to roll with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take one for the team. <laughs> I, I tap quick. There you go. Always a nice guy, Gary. Yeah. Gary, how's your knee, by the way? You know, it's feeling better. It's feeling definitely better. I, I got out on the mat today. Uh, uh, the bad thing is I got a bad left knee and a and a bad right Achilles. So, uh, I'm pretty hobbling everywhere. So, uh, but I'm feeling better. So I can't go wrong with that. Still training, still training. Yep. There you go. There you go. That's great. Uh, and that kind of brings us to, you know, a, an area where Gary is an expert and, and Gary and Joe have teamed up, uh, yet again to produce an amazing audio book that they have no idea what the title even is, but they're going to make up some great content and really sell us this idea of their audio book, Hobbalong Jiu-Jitsu. And basically, you know, Gary's hobbling along all the time, but he gets on the mat and boom, he's rolling good. And, uh, and I'm sure we've all been there to where, you know, you don't feel that good, you know, walking around, going to work, you know, you, you know doing day-to-day -day life. Once you get on the mat, something happens and you can roll just fine. And then you hobble off the mat again. And I don't know if this is a strategy to help you do better on the mat, kind of show the weak side, or if this is just really the way it is and, and you get that adrenaline dump and you actually get to live for the few minutes you're rolling and you go back to your kind of, uh, you know, deprived life of not being able to actually move very well. 
But uh, this is an interesting concept. I think that at some point in time, we'll all be there where we're hobbling and then we're rolling great. Well, Byron, I hate to break it to you, and you're finally going to real hear the real story. Joe and I, we're, we're older grapplers. What? You know, I, I'm a... Yeah, I'm a little older than Joe, um, as Joe likes to always kindly point out to me. <laughs> but me and Joe, we are competitive. We want to win. And, I mean, we don't have the stamina to keep up with these young guys. We don't have the strength. You know, we, we think we're smarter because we're a little bit older. We have a little bit less hair, uh, but we do have more hair in our ears. <laughs> um, but so we have to take every advantage. I'm not hurt. We make this stuff up. We get out on the mat. We we're perfect till we step into the gym, or till somebody's going to see us. Then we fake a walk. We we me and Joe we actually take acting classes to learn how to walk like we're hurt. When you grab one of our body parts, we we scream like we're hurt. And then while the person lets go a little bit, we attack. And uh, it's a good way to win. When do you when do you agree, Joe? Yeah, and you know I think it's interesting, Gary. We should tell our listeners where we got the idea for the hop along. Jiu Jitsu. Oh yeah, uh, we, we we model we model our game after the lovable cowboy Hopalong Cassidy, <laughs> and if you don't know him, uh, Wikipedia describes him as rude, dangerous, and rough talking. He had a wooden leg, which caused him to walk with a little hop, hence the nickname Hopalong Cassidy. So yeah. that's, that's pretty much us, right? Uh, rude, dangerous. Yeah, rude. Rough. Yeah, rude. I don't know about dangerous, but we're definitely rude <laughs> and gruff. <laughs> I don't know where to go, go from here because I can just make fun of you guys for being old. <laughs> Hopalong <laughs> Cassidy. I'm, I just uh, well, Google Well, you're too young to even know who Hopalong Cassidy is. But, um, you know, we, we do a lot of different things in this audio book. You know, the first couple of chapters – we start off dealing with uh, bad legs, you know, so we're going to walk, you know, we're going to teach you how to walk with a limp. Um, we're going to teach you all sorts of stuff. I mean, Joe has really helped me. I used to just be good and say I hurt my knee and I learned how to walk with a hurt knee. But Joe has really helped me out with a strained calf and with a torn uh, Achilles and doing really good on that. And then Joe next week is going to teach a class on how to pretend like you have plantar fasciitis. And uh, fake that too. So uh, Joe has really got the lower leg down. I'm more around the knees. So I I do the first couple of chapters on knees, and then Joe, you know, takes over the lower leg uh, after that. And uh, some people say that the reason Joe does the lower leg part is because he has a foot fetish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gary, that's a whole nother audio book. We'll deal with that one later. <laughs> Oh man, no the chapter on gout though. That's that's the key right there. So check it out, guys. <laughs> only uh, only eleven ninety nine a chapter. You get one chapter installed every week. You get a ch- chapter a week for fifty two weeks. Yep. <laughs> and Joe actually has a an appendix in it. Not appendix the body part, but a little appendix at the end of the uh, the audio book. And he tells you how to actually make gout look like you really have gout like they will actually have guys come in with cherry juice and cherries you know which is a good way to uh, treat your gout so uh you know to fake gout you know you also also want to bring cherries with you so uh you know really thank joe for that one because uh, that'll take your acting over the top that's joe's uh appendix G- gary has a, a section in the appendix as well as of how to fake uh getting your appendix removed the week before and just to act like you just got out of surgery and, and to roll like, like that for a little while until you could uh, throw it on and, and really choke them down pretty good, Gary. Yep. And even on top of that, Joe and I were talking with Byron here, you know, before the show, but Joe and I secretly recorded him. We are going to have another appendix with Byron <laughs> where he talks about getting a sex change operation and rolling after that, you know, within a week. So uh, that's another one that's just special. Um, so uh, Byron will be talking about that. The key is within the week. I mean, that's a pretty fast turnaround to have things turned around like that. Oh, yeah, you definitely... Ordinarily, people are concerned about the uh, 
power and size and strength of transgender athletes. But uh, the women on the mats have taken a look at Byron where he was before, <laughs> and, after, and they're not worried about it. <laughs> oh, man, it's still the weakest one on the mat. So, uh, yeah, it's not an issue. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely check it out. It's going to be, be out in time for Christmas. So it's going to make great gifts, and uh, definitely everybody who gets one will really enjoy it. Yep. Hey, uh, swing by our social media outlets. Uh, our biggest one is uh, Facebook. Or it seems like we're putting something up every day, almost. Or basically, I don't know. Uh, and that's usually Joe. Joe finds cool stuff, and he'll share it with everybody on our Facebook page, uh, BJJ or Facebook slash BJJ Brick. Or if you just search for it, it's not that hard to find. And uh, we appreciate all the interaction we have with the people on there. It really means a lot to us, and trust us. We see the familiar faces pop up. Oh, this person. You know, when we get some likes, we I, I always look at them and see who's liking it, and I see a lot of times the same people, and I really appreciate that, guys. Uh, that you're out there and that you're paying attention and hopefully learning something and getting something of value there. Also, our YouTube channel is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we just recently uh, got over a thousand subscribers to our YouTube channel. Um, it's it, We have a lot more listeners to the podcast, but YouTube is growing and uh, we're always excited to, to develop that. And we store up some videos from time to time as well. Yep. If you see something you like on uh, Facebook, uh, leave a comment. Between the three of us watching it, you're sure to get uh, some dialogue going. So, yeah, we'd look forward to some interaction, guys. Definitely check out the BJJ Brick app. It's the easiest way to listen to the show each and every week. Plus, you get some uh, private content uh, not available on the show. So definitely check it out and then download it. Yep. Super fun and easy in any app store you want to shop at. It's free. Check us out next week. We have another great show lined up. Stay sweaty, my friends. And don't forget to shower. Train hard, train smart, and get better. We'll see you on the mats, guys. Keep on hopping. (laughs) Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Thanks so much for checking out this episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. Check us out next week. And don't forget to check out the archives at bjbrick.com or on this YouTube channel.